you know what you're here for. Yes. It's Let's Plan a Camp. All right, I'm going to have to go to the next screen. Which? This, yep. by first introducing ourselves. My name is Nina Moore. I am the Director of Operations for Google for Cup. I am also the Digital Product Manager for uh, Digital Polygon. That's my like, full-time job. And I moonlight as the Director of Operations for our nonprofit. And I'm Kirsten Burgard. I am the president of the board for the Drupal for Gov Association. Um, and I have been running Drupal for Gov since I founded it in 2009. So, next one. So before we kind of dive into like, what, what we're doing, how to plan a camp, we want to give you receipts. I think this is extremely important for you to know, like, we are coming from experience. We have planned so many events. I cannot even give you a round ballpark number of the amount we planned. So, I've been doing this for 10 years of the organization. Um, my biggest event that we planned was uh, 1,100 people. And at that point, I was the logistics coordinator. So I was the person managing this insane line and getting me all that, which was lovely. Um, but we've also done really small events, like, well, smaller events. <laughs> Recently, we came back um, for 2023. We had GovCon, and it was 400 people. And somehow that was way more manageable, <laughs> but still quite a lot. So we've done training days and half days and full-on camps and conference level um, things. So these are our receipts. Um, so that you can kind of trust what we're saying because we've had the experience for over a decade. And the hotels have been flooded. <laughs> <laughs> that flood, yes. So, so many experiences. So many experiences, all the fun ones. <laughs> oh, so our, I guess this is mine. Our agenda for today is we're gonna go over some of our assumptions because it's really important that we state them up front. We are also going to talk about our Camp Planning 101, which uses some resources from the Drupal.org pages, as well as things that we've just learned over time. And then, really, Nina's going to go over all of the analytics and some of the lessons learned that we have from all of these experiences. Yeah, it's never, it's never done. You like say it's done, and then you're like, LOL, jokes, jokes, jokes. It's just another sprint. We're just getting back into the swing of things. Continuous improvement. <laughs> there we go. So our assumptions. So here's our, our basic assumptions. One, you are not doing this alone. You can do it. It's not practical. Please try not to. Number two, venue. Venue really kind of is one of the number one things that you need to come up with. And you should have a few options before you start planning. Nina? Number three, outline. So like, you don't have to have your dates exact to the moment, to the second, but you have to have a general understanding of when you're likely to have it. If you want to have an event in summer, fantastic. There's your general outline. If you want to, you know, have training that's going to be a full day training, great. You have a general outline. But you need to start somewhere. And number four. We got resources. Or at least you have a network in order to access some resources. Like, you can get money somehow, hopefully through legal means, everyone. And you can try and get trainers or people to actually have sessions if you're doing like a full, you know, camp. You have an ability to get who you need to be there. So, these are our assumptions going into this talk. Okay, moving on. Camp Planning 101. Yes, get your notebooks ready. <laughs> we actually made that. So if you want to pull out a computer or pull out a, a notebook, it's, it's going to go fast. Okay, venues. One of the really big things to keep in mind is what you're trying to achieve by your event. And your venue really kind of sets the tone. For instance, this is from the event where we hosted 1,100 people at a venue that only holds 1,200. When they say 1,200, Think 1,000. 1,200 is not real. It's their, their event space really isn't what they're telling you. Uh, next up, we also really tried this year to break it between two different hotels. Even though they're literally across the street from each other, try not to do stuff like that. Learn from our, our fails 
<laughs> it was a great experience and a great event, and we also know we're never doing that again. Now your menu is like a thousand and ten percent the main thing you need to focus on. Before you even think about having the event, you need to have a destination in place. What is your location? So what you're keeping in mind. <laughs> Thank you. I was more ready. That was weird. Oh, not me. You're keeping in mind three things: availability, size, and location. And for, for me, really, it's the location that matters. So like, the question that you want to ask yourself as you're going through the selection process of your menu is, um, is it near public transportation? Does that matter for you, right? For us, we're in DC. A lot of people come in through Metro. It has to be Metro accessible. For you, if you're in a location that everyone kind of drives a car, fantastic. But um, no one's going to go to a cabin in the woods. They're just not, right? So like, don't choose somewhere that is I don't know, a horror film set, yes. which does kind of happen, right? So you want to choose a location that's accessible. Um, the other thing that we are currently going through is, is it secure? <laughs> what are the security concerns? Um, we are actually planning another event, and <laughs> we they, recently found out. They warn you up front on the website. Um, they use TSA's requirements for entrance to the building, meaning you have to take off your shoes. Mm -hmm. Right? I do a free check. <laughs> <laughs> Global entry. Yeah. Nope. 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 So like, we're 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 actively deciding. Um, how many shoes do we want to be taking off? Me, yes. zero. 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 So again, location matters. Size. So this one's fairly big because again, the it so it holds twelve hundred. LOL, really a thousand. Really a thousand. Your size matters. Understanding before you even start planning the sessions, how many rooms you have, um, how many rooms those seat, and uh, we have had the fire And bottles. where you're going to put the lunch. Oh, oh my God, the lunch. Do not get us started on the lunch, which is an ongoing issue. It's been fun. Um, it's been fun. But to like the capacity of the event, you really have to understand the size of the location. And the point here we're trying to make is availability is really our last on our list. It's really only important in terms of determining whether or not there are other events going on. Yeah. We don't like to butt up against TripleCon Europe or another camp. So we always know that like Asheville is going to be in July. So we try not to be the following week because we really screwed up their attendance one year. We don't want to do that again. So we try to do early August instead. Exactly. Yeah. But we also learned a valuable lesson holding it on November 1st. Yeah. The day after Halloween. <laughs> Maybe not the best choice. Why, why we did that? Who knows? Um, but again, we learned lessons. Then we're still learning lessons after a decade. So like every every year, we just iterate. Continuous so, improvement. Um, three things must keep in mind as you're going through planning your camp. And that takes us to budget. Um, your budget should be realistic. You should have numbers behind it real numbers that you have done research on. It should include location. Has um, anything related to legal? Do you need to have insurance for your event? Um, it's been helpful for us that we haven't needed that at government facilities. This year we needed it because we were at a hotel. So those are kinds of things that you have to keep in mind and when you're budgeting. And I will also mention that MidCamp has a really great budget that they had open sourced years ago. I don't know if it's still open. Highly recommend looking at it if it is. Yes. Yeah, it's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but the other thing is you have to research. So we spent a lot of time researching the area where our venue is going to be. Um, we tend to be in Bethesda, so that means like knowing how much food is going to be and how much like we're able to spend on the food that we get. Um, building those connections. But then reference, oh my goodness, the, I'm blanking on the acronym, E, G, C, Avi's here, the... Event, event Organizer Working Group. Thank yes. you so much. Event Organizer Working Group. E-O-W-G. E-O-W-G. Oh my goodness. That, again, the acronym to stop that thing. So, <laughs> tons of reference material. We highly encourage you. We um, very strongly do not like to create the wheel useless. Um, we like to iterate. So we find it, we research, we're like, mid-camp, great budget, let's try and use something like that. And we iterate off it instead of creating from scratch because there are so many resources out there. They already exist. Okay, so. Fundraising. 
Uh, I have the special privilege this year of uh, being one of the fundraising coordinators. Never again. <laughs> so, <laughs> fundraising. Um, it's it's gonna get it's gonna get a little wild. Uh, a little ridiculous for sure, for sure. And by the end, you're gonna question some things, but it'll be totally worth it. You're gonna have a great event. So let's talk about fundraising. Typically, your team. Nope. Oh, sorry. No, 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 that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. I would just forgot this slide. Um, donors don't give to institutions. They invest in ideas and in people. I believe that that's a thousand and ten percent true. Same goes with volunteers. Your volunteers are actually volunteering um, with your organization. They're volunteering with you and everything that you represent, which is how Kirsten has been able to snag so many people to come over to the Drupal side for her. So that when you are going after your sponsors, you need to believe in your mission and be able to really talk to your mission why it's important to have your event. You need to have that down pat because you're really selling an idea to them. And if they don't believe it, probably it's because you also don't believe it very much. So you really have to have that down. Your fundraising team. Um, I would say this, this is really the team that you need to have at your core. Um, Money really does drive your event. You can't book a venue if you do not have fun to do with that. Right? You can't have an event if you do not have the capital to put that event on. So I would highly encourage a team of at minimum three people. If you try and do it all by yourself or with like a team of two, it becomes very, very difficult. So assemble your team, very much a vendor style. Um, highly, highly encourage you to create sponsor or buyer personas. That has helped us so much. We're actually going to show two examples um, of like who we go after. That's so wrong. But like who we like in terms of sponsors and who we've had great success with because we've done buyer personas. Um, when you are meeting with your sponsors, you want to try as much as you can to relate to a business value. This is really important because they're giving you money for a reason. Yes, it is to support the community a lot of the time, but it's also because you get in contact with certain people at your event, whether they are developers or UX designers or whoever, they are getting a tangible benefit. So link that. Say you can get in contact with people who are decision makers, um, with senior members, and have the analytics to back that up as well. A little harder when you're first starting out, but still you want to try and relate that to a business um, value for them. Next. Um, a lot of times, and it's recently, I went around to all of our sponsors at GovCon and I introduced myself because a lot of them only connected over email. And it was amazing how a lot of them were like, huh, I don't think we ever got an email from GovCon. No. I was like, so you must have because you are here. Um, so you definitely did. I don't, I don't, but I don't think that's right. So put a face to the name, like introduce yourself. If you can have a face-to-face -face conversation, do that. Um, I know no one likes Zoom meetings or Google Meets, but it really does help to solidify a connection and then have that connection last year over year. Um, and I'll show you how that works. Not now. I know. <laughs> but in another slide soon. Be flexible and customizable. 90% um, of the time, all of the sponsorships and fundraising we do eventually become customizable. For some reason, I, I cannot explain. Um, they see a sponsorship package and they're like, I like some of it, but you know what I'm thinking? And then it becomes a customizable sponsorship. That happens to at least 30% to be flexible. Just, just kind of try and make it as uh, customizable as possible for them. We highly encourage you to have a short or small list of sponsor benefits when you go into it and allow them to sort of bring what they want to the table and negotiate. If they want more things, absolutely. We are happy to accommodate that for a price. Next, everything in writing. Oh, I learned this the hard way recently. Uh, if last month, I believe. Yeah. Um, get it all in writing with signatures and dates, be it DocuSign. I preach at the uh, foot of DocuSign. If it is not in writing, it does not exist. And I'm sure many of you know this, but um, give a lot of volunteers that I do this because I love it. It was a hard lesson to learn, again. So everything in writing, um, no matter what. And last but not least, easy wins. Minimum effort and maximum value. Uh, that is something 
we are getting better at. Recently, we discovered, very recently, this past got calm data, our sponsor would like social media, which was like kind of an obvious thing to, to, to say now that I'm bringing it out loud. But and she is going to go into that in way more detail. Way more detail. But we started implementing social media. Didn't take us a lot of effort at all, and yet it was a huge difference in terms of sponsorships. So um, your team focus on these areas. Um, and there are more that I'm not mentioning, but like these are the core ones I would say you want to keep in mind. Ah, and last but not least, know your audience. This goes back to those personas. Really have a firm understanding of who's coming to your event and who might like to come to your event. Um, just kind of have an idea of who you're going after. That way you can start social media and actually target those individuals. Start having listservs that go after who you want to attend. And then how you can also bring them together so that they can network with each other. Because, you know, when you're going to an event, you want to go see your friends, but yeah. honestly, your friends already know you. You need to go out and be on those, those typical folks that you normally go to. So find ways for people to be able to interact and have networking events. Yeah, and we love a good game night. Oh, we love a good oh game night. Oh my we love a good game night. Like, if you ever come around that, we are always a game night. Okay. Personas, so here are just two examples of the type of uh, sponsor personas we have. Very, very basic. Actually, compiled by our interns. I'm very excited to have interns in our organization. But this just gave us an understanding of who we should go after and who's likely to be our sponsors. We also have ones for attendees, but I just kind of wanted to give you an idea. If you've done this before, um, you're probably looking and you're like, wow, this is super rudimentary. I wouldn't have done it this way. <laughs> totally agree. But this is really just our starting point. So we have an idea of who we're going after in terms of sponsors. And this is what we use to make sure we know who we have and know who we're going after. So then that brings us to ticketing. Um, so you'll notice that we're talking about drop off here, which is my bailiwick. So I have some very hard and fast rules about how we calculate for drop off. We are a free event. All of our events are free because it's primarily held at government facilities. And we can't charge because then we have all kinds of other legal requirements for us to be able to charge, which is why it's free. So, pick a system and keep your records. We originally started with Eventbrite and they changed their system over the summer so that no, you can't have free events any longer. So, we have migrated from Eventbrite to Ticket Tailor. Ticket Tailor allows us a lot of flexibility. It is much harder to use. It is not as intuitive. However, it will also cost us less money in the end. Um, Eventbrite was taking anywhere from three to five percent of our sponsorship money, and we collect about eighty thousand dollars in sponsorship money. To lose five percent is a huge loss. Ticket Taylor is two to three percent, depending on how we're getting the money in. It is a huge difference. Also, plan early and inform late. One of our biggest problems within the Drupal community in DC is that people sign up as soon as you post it and those people don't show up. So what we typically do is we have a six week window if we're doing a half day and we're going to target about a hundred people for attendance. If we're doing it in the six week window, I'm not telling them about the event until three weeks out. Additionally, after this last event, I actually think I'm going to tell them at three weeks out and we're not going to open tickets until a week out. Yeah, you'll get to know it and this will cost to remind them in a second. The next, overestimate and prepare. If you're going to be providing lunch and you have 400 people who sign up, even if they're paid, some people don't eat the lunch. So instead of having leftovers that you have to either throw away or donate, plan for less people. It is easier to not have to do any of that stuff than to have a bunch of stuff that you have to get rid of. So, or you could do it the way Asheville Camp does, which is a brilliant plan to just use a cafeteria. Seriously. And ask if they're coming to lunch on different days, which they may change their mind, but it at least gives you a gauge, an estimate. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that's how we do lunches, which is the bane of our existence. Um, additionally, remind them, remind them, remind them, <sighs> remind them. It's that old adage, tell someone what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then repeat. So one of the things that we have learned from our attendees, we're a free event. We have about a 40% drop off on a normal year. We had slightly higher than a 50% drop off for GovCon, which is unusual for us. We've never been above 30%. And our most recent event had a almost 60% drop off. So things we have learned. How do you define drop off? Um, if a hundred people sign up for it and only forty people show up, we have had a sixty percent drop. Yeah, which which happens a lot. And this kind of goes back to the point you the this yeah. uh, why we say keep records? Because we are currently calling all of our records for people who are continually signing up for half days, for webinars, for gun fun, just not showing up. We are kicking them off our list because we are costing seats to people who might actually want to attend. Because oftentimes our events sell out. And they are preventing other people from going. I can't have that. That's just not going to work. Okay. It's a measure. Uh, measurement, yes. I love uh, John, my boss, who I always introduce that way. Um, no, I am the massive advocate for measuring analytics and metrics. Oh my goodness, I love it. She's never seen data that she doesn't love. It's true, and I hate math in school. But that's besides the point. So, no what to measure. This was huge. Um, we recently started to really look at what we're measuring. So we would look at things like email open rates and social media engagement. And then we would then talk about, well, why are we looking at this? Like, what's the value in looking at this data? Is it to improve engagement? Is it to cross-reference with leads? Is it to be able to show these results to sponsors? Yes, the last one, we have two reports that we're so excited to be able to deliver to our sponsors. Um, but last but not least, make a hypothesis and then test it. So what did you learn? Did this meet your expectations? Did it exceed your expectations? Was it not even in the realm and it performed super poorly? But you have to measure something. You have to figure out what and why you're measuring it and build a hypothesis for that as well. Woo! It's done! <laughs> You've completed it. No other work left. Yeah, you can just right. go home and take it. Time for a nap. Yeah. I love all of jokes. No. So, I love memes. And you'll see another one in here as well. But, I don't always analyze data. But when I do, I want lots of it. And this is true. So, up to this point, you've seen a very fancy, very nice slideshow. That's just going to cancel itself out right now. You're going to see the screenshots. So many screenshots. <laughs> Get ready for it. Ready? Ready? Here we go. Our pre-event survey. So this year we made sure to do a pre-event survey for all of our sponsors to better understand just them in general, to build our sponsor, to refine our sponsor personas. So this is just two things that we looked at. So our first um, survey was our pre-event. We had 19 respondents. And the rule of thumb is that if you get 25 to 30% um, response rate, that is a valid survey. We had 28 sponsors this year. We got 19 uh, responses in our pre-event. Valid data. Woohoo. Um, additionally, we had... Oh, good. We haven't gotten to the post event, so I'm going to talk about that now. Um, we looked at the size of the agency to better understand, like, who is doing this? Who is sponsoring this? We were actually pretty surprised to know it's mainly small uh, companies and then large companies, and there's really no in between. That is who is giving to us. So it made me question, like, okay, well, why aren't, oh, I'm sorry, small a bit, but why aren't larger companies going after it? And who are the large companies that are doing Drupal? We're talking like General Electric and General Dynamics. They all have Drupal shops. Mm -hmm. Who's in Hamilton? All have Drupal shops, all yeah. with way more than a thousand employees. And fun fact, they used to sponsor us. So I did do a few emails being like, hey, what's up, bro? Uh, so yeah, we, we kind of were able to figure out, well, who is sponsoring us? And if it's not large camp, um, large organizations, well, then why? And shouldn't we build a persona around that? See, we want to go around uh, to those. So then we also looked at how many years. Now, this was always, this is fun. Um, mainly, we have a really good retention rate. Uh, almost half of all of our sponsors come back year after year after year, which is great. We also were really surprised at how many new sponsors we had. A third of all our sponsors this past GovCon were brand new. 
never heard of us before. And it was all word of mouth, so that was really great to see. So the other thing we measured, where we wanted to understand um, what were the benefits they were getting out of this, and like, did they like them, was it useful? And so, in looking at it, what what is the benefit that our sponsors really want? Anyone, anyone want to that? Website. Logo, logo on the website. Yes, everyone wants logo on the website, and that is a very small like amount of effort. Literally, putting a logo on a website takes two seconds. So, little effort, maximum results. That's one example. What's the other thing that, just looking at that, what's the other thing that they For those want? of you who can see it, it's tiny, we know. Social media. Yes. The only year we've ever done social media, and yet it was the second thing that everyone wanted. And I was actually told before we had wanted it. I don't I don't think that's possible really on social media. Like Mina, I don't I don't think that's a thing. So what can we just see? It's definitely a thing. A hundred percent it is a thing. So if we didn't do this survey, we would not have known it. And honestly, it would not have been one of our benefits that we uh, included. The other thing is we looked at what was most appealing and Surprisingly, they're not coming for the keynote, they're not coming for the sessions, they're coming for the people. And so if I know you're coming for the people who are coming to our event, then my next question is, okay, well, who are these people? And why do you so desperately want these attendees? Which is not this one. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. No, no, fine. Again, I'm, I'm missing my marks. <laughs> so in comparing the results, we have our pre-event, we have our post-event. Pre-event was 19 response. Post that was 13, still well in our 25 to 35% range. It is still accurate data. So, well, going back one. So, pre event, before we had our event, who was coming back next year? Almost everyone. 94 responded. Like 94% were coming back. So excited. And like a one maybe. After the event, it was 69%. So not terrible, right? Still 70%, but very, very much concerned about the maybe there, right? Why was it 30%? Um, anyone want to guess? Oh, well, no, no, no. you don't have to guess anymore. <laughs> oh, say <laughs> <Dang> it! <laughs> okay, can anyone tell me, based on what they're saying here, what was the problem? The venue. The venue, the one thing that you really need to have, which is why we're like, you've got to start with a good venue. Uh, Cause yeah, it was the venue. We're not a fan, multiple times. Um, so yeah, because we we really wanted to put on the event, we tried our best, we worked with what we had, but the menu was an issue, and that could potentially cost us sponsorships going in the future. And that is something we are now trying to actively deal with, but we would not have known it had we not taken some survey results. The other thing we were preparing is again, did their minds change after the conference with their benefits, right? Before, we saw that logo on website was really massive, social media was really massive. Um, we were kind of surprised the Expo booth wasn't. It was like a 68%, so I actually said, you know what, next year, we'll just make it optional, people can buy it. And then after the event, boom, look at that Expo booth. You can't even see it. It was really popular. Again, granted, we had 13 respondents here, 19 respondents, uh, Information is still valid, so unfortunately my idea is doing an extra booth <laughs> super cost was swiftly put to bed. Wouldn't have known that if I hadn't done this survey. Um, but more or less, the same data still applied. So that was good to know that their minds hadn't really changed about their benefits after the event. It changed about the venue. <laughs> yeah, they did really The venue was terrible. Yeah. The other thing we do is our lovely interns also put together reports. Um, and so you can see our retention rates year over year. So overall, from 2016 to 2018, we still had an 80% retention, which is fantastic for our camps. Um, in addition, we had 30% coming back year after year after year, which again, you can kind of plan on. So we use a lot of these metrics to be able to plan year over year. So could we have a bet? No. Uh, could we? But yes, could we? Could we have a GovCon 2024? Yes. Would it be successful? Probably. Would we get sponsors? Yeah, most likely, because we have that data. So we do a lot of future forecasting based on the data that we have here. Um, but if you look at our sponsors by year, there was a year that kind of really changed things. Anyone want to guess what year that was? 2008. 
<laughs> yeah. 2008, <laughs> absolutely. 100%, 2008. Um, <laughs> Same year you all had to deal with. Yeah, 2019. Oh. 2020. Well, 2020, yes. In 2019, we had highs to that. Oh, man. 2019 was a hard year. 1,100 people. Friggin' 43 sponsors. Amazing. In 2019, we were actually turning people away. Truly. And then, COVID. And now, <laughs> and now we are not where we, well, not where we were. Not even, <laughs> not even kind of where we were in terms of really where we started. Uh, this was updated before we actually had the event, so it is 28 and not 23 sponsors. But even then, we've lost a lot of sponsors that used to support us year over year because they're no longer a business um, or because they've switched out of Drupal. And so we've had to reconcile how we measure year over year and how we forecast, which is a hard pill to swallow. As I promised, all the screenshots, this is an actual report that I just took a bunch of screenshots of, but it was like 14 pages and I didn't want to subject you all to that. So I took the most important screenshots. Um, we did a bunch of surveys. We measured our attendees at the conference, which if anyone attended and had to do that survey, hey, thank you so much, <laughs> appreciate it. But this is what kind of netted out from that. So the important things here are in terms of attending demographics, 85% of people who are attending our event have purchasing power from their organization. That's amazing. That's something I can tell my sponsors. In addition, 76% of respondents are going to be here next year. Got to plan around that. That's really easy to plan around. So again, I can tell these things to my sponsors. Um, 88 of respondents were like, this was great. High satisfaction with the event. 84, love the sessions. High quality sessions. 78, we're happy with the great event communication. Not as high, but eh, I'll take it. And then 79, we're like, the trainings were great. Those are all... Uh, statistics and data that I can show to my sponsors to say here's really what you're paying for and here's what you're getting here's who you're interacting with because the industry we have government contractors higher ed nonprofit government and private so a good mix of all of them but they also understand 30% of who they're going to contact with are government employees and at least 85% of these are going to be people with purchasing power of course most people who attend our event are senior like one and two are like pretty high up C-level, um, not senior, uh, senior within their organization. So also things that are useful in terms of deciding if you want to sponsor our event. Um, and the last but not least, our event communication. This was the first year we really kind of looked at our event communication. We sent 30 emails, which is a lot. And it did not feel like 30 if we were doing it. It was like, what, three a week for 10 weeks? <laughs> Um, but we had, so we have a listserv of about 7,000, 7, right? 7,400. Thank you. 7,400. We have an open rate of 2,200. This is again why we are calling our email list because a good amount of people are not opening that. And of those people who do click and open our um, message, 700 actually interact with it. So we are now in the process of trying to call our, our list and also figuring out of those 700 who are opening it, are they getting a ticket? Are they looking at the webinars? What are they actively doing? And this helps us better understand what's going on. So that brings us to the lessons we have learned. Some hard ways, some not so hard ways. Um, one of the big things that we do is we basically do a retrospective after the event. We did it this year, actually, I think during the event. Typically what we try to do is take actions from that and then work it into some sort of a plan for the following year. Um, what's really helpful when we do that is that you can actually incorporate into those experiences things that you want to get rid of or things that you want to add. For instance, we used to have, um, David Stoline had suggested that we do a, I'll call it a treasure hunt. So you have a bingo card and you go to all the tables who participate in the bingo card and then we give out a prize at the end. Um, yeah, it was a lot of work and not a lot of people actually participated. And we dropped it after the third year. 
just said. We gave away MacBooks. Yeah. Yeah, people were like, real disappointed. Mm -hmm. People were like, um, where's that MacBook you guys used to do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, not anymore. Yeah, so it's, it's really important to do that retrospective so that you can hear from your, not just your sponsors or your attendees, but you can hear from the team. Who liked doing X or who liked doing Y? And what things worked and what things didn't. So we've been able to actually do continuous improvement because of this. And it's really important that you do include it into your plan for the following year. Okay. Oh, yes. So, you know, that's right. There's not really any text. It's just to me. That's because you just got to call all the time with everybody. Um, I, I I do so many follow-ups, uh, I honestly get tired of writing the emails myself. But it is extremely important to be able to have people uh, complete surveys, to be able to get sponsors, remembering who we are. In fact, I recently went uh, to GovCon last year, not last year, then Pittsburgh. And um, TripleCon. TripleCon, thank you, my goodness. TripleCon in Pittsburgh, and I had this Red Riding Hood basket filled with coffee beans, and I physically went around to every one of our sponsors who had sponsored us previously in the past, and I reintroduced myself, and a lot of them were like, I don't, I don't think we did that. You definitely did. No, no, I would have remembered if we sponsored whatever your campus. No, you definitely did, actually, three years in a row. And um, that's because for two years of COVID, we had not followed up at all, and they forgot about us. And it's true. Awesome. We, we walked away in 2021. We were burned out from doing it online, and online was so much worse than doing so it in person. Awful. So absolutely draining for the entire team that people just left, and that was just not useful. So we decided in 2022 to take a break and not do it. We continued to do our webinar series, but that's just not enough. Nope, and we stopped following up. And the minute that you stop being in the forefront of people's minds, they will forget you. It, it just is what happens. So, Follow up all the time. Yeah. So, finally, you can rest. It's the end of it. You've done it. It is done. And it's not really done. You have to redo it all over again. So, what we try to do is after GovCon, we take a break. We take a month off. And then we start planning again. Typically, we host the event in August, um, either very end of July or beginning of August, depending on the venue. And then we don't meet again until September. If we meet in September, sometimes we just do a phone call just to check in with people. And then we actually physically start planning together as a group. And we do it in person starting in October. Yeah. And, you know, this time, gun call was exhausting for us. It really, really was. Um, and so we have been a little bit more lax, taking a little bit of a longer break. And it's been hard to get back in the group things <laughs> because I did not follow up. Oh man, I just told you guys to follow up. I absolutely did not do it for like two months. Um, so I'm now in the process of doing that, making sure we have our same volunteers, making sure we still have our same sponsors. Um, so And that we can find a better venue. Yeah. We'd like to be back at our old venue. It's the National Institute of Health at the Natural Center, but they have some COVID protocols and we're not sure we'll be able to go back there. So I think it's going to depend on what happens with CDC and their upcoming stuff and whether or not the National Institute will also agree with that. So we'll see. We'll see. We're, we're hoping we can get them to convince them to do a half day. Our half days are typically hosted for anywhere from 50 to 400 people. They're a smaller venue. We do a large auditorium and then some breakout sessions. And the first one that we're going to be doing is going to be around Health IT and Drupal. So that's coming up in it's June. It's coming up. June-ish. <laughs> it's coming up. We're trying to make sure that we're not up against any events. So yep. we're, we're thinking June-ish. And that's it? No. Did you say June for go? Oh, no, June for something else. For uh, half day. For the health summit that we're doing. Oh. Yeah. Um, yes, so that will be coming up. We are continuing to do a bunch of other programming so that we stay relevant. But we've given you a lot of information. It's also three point. Right? <laughs> um, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. Question and a comment. Um, the comment got con last year was great. Oh, it was really sure. awesome. Met a ton of people. Um, please do that again. Uh, if you do it again this year, is it more likely going to be November or is it going to be some other day? 
we are we are hoping it's going to be in August. In August. We typically are in August. That's where we would like to be. Um, and there's some very specific reasons for it in DC that way. August is when there is a congressional recess. All of the prices go down for all of the hotels. So when people come to visit, we can get them the government rate, which is lower than the traditional rate that most tourists get. And that's a requirement we force our hotels. I don't force the right word. We, we have a negotiator. Um, it's Yigo Travel. And Yigo does the negotiation with the hotels to get us the reduced rate for, for that. So, yes, that is one of the reasons we try to do it in August. Good luck. I hope you guys get a nice thing. Thank you. Um, and then the second one was um, talked about drop off mm -hmm. rates. Um, is there a way you could charge? for a ticket to hold the place and then refund it if they show up? There wasn't a way to do that in Eventbrite that didn't end up charging us money. Now, I don't know if that's the same with Ticket Taylor. We haven't tried to look into that with Ticket Taylor. That Eventbrite charged us a fee. So, no. Absolutely couldn't have done it that way. Um, additionally. Additionally, if we're hosted actually at a government facility, we can't charge anything. There's, the reason is called FACA, F-A-C-A. -A. It's a law that, is, that relates to working groups. And once you start paying, and people have to pay, everyone has to pay across the board. And we become a working group. And we have to deal with these other rules and regulations outside of like the typical stuff. And then another additionally. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Um, but other additionally is a large amount of our volunteers are also government workers and they cannot deal with money. So she would not be able to do any of the ticketing um, because she is, works for labor. So it would fall on us who are not government employees. And there aren't as many who would think of the organization. So that's why I became a sponsor for coordinator this year, which I don't like doing. Um, so you also have to like factor that in to know who, you, who can volunteer to do those types of things. That's another thing you might want to consider as well. Guppies are great volunteers. Oh my God, so but, but they just can't ever touch well, any ethics. of them. Well, we we well, have ethics. very strict ethics rules. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, so having grown up in the D.C. area, gone to college down there, uh, are you not open to having your event at a university? Oh, you know we've absolutely lived at a university. <laughs> And the University of Maryland would have been fantastic. They are Drupal, Drupal shop. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, we have to still pay. We pay a reduced rate for them. Um, and for a two-day conference at the Alumni Association, I am an alumni, um, but I got the faculty rate, and it's $25,000. So I think the other thing that we didn't mention is that our pricing for GovCon is to cover the event, and that has been the case for a while. Um, we didn't plan as well as we probably should have, but we charge our sponsors based on what we need to cover for the event. We have done that for and, years. And a little bit more. Like, and when I say a little bit more, um, Amy, our former person who did this, her marketing person, would charge, I think, about a 10% more because then we pays for our Zoom um, and our MailChimp. Mm -hmm. And Maybe there's a couple of other uh, other things that we do because of the webinars. So that's what we did. But it wasn't enough because now we've had to add DocuSign and we really need Google Suite. And it's like, we could really use a project management or a CRM. And it's like, goodness. Um, yeah. yeah. And they all kind of uh, build up over time. So our also encouragement is that uh, whatever you decide to charge, um, you will you know, do the research and also kind of see how long you want to do this for. We've been doing it for 10 years. and. Our model has just been, let's, let's charge what we can to fund the next event, which is great. It has worked. Um, but now that prices are changing and things are uh, kind of in flux, uh, we've had to really consider how we're charging our sponsors, um, which is something we're actively continuing to kind of work on. Avi? How did you come up with a sponsored questionnaire questions? Um, surveys, surveys are always hard. So. You knew I chat you PC didn't like <laughs> She chat GPT it using using um, Anita Borg. 
That's true. That's true. I did. I did my research. I'm not gonna say I didn't do my research, but also, ChatGPT is a tool. I found it incredibly useful as long as I set the correct parameters for it. And I'm not a marketing person. I don't write surveys. I hate all. Of <laughs> but I don't like it. Um, so I did what had to be done. But that's sort of how I came up with those. I also talked to people. Um, I asked a lot of people in our organization, like, what do we need to ask our sponsor? So research, as you could say, and then also just talking to people to kind of figure that out. Um, and we do have the report, if anyone's super interested. Oh, I, can't, I love that. Man. We actually shared it on the um, working group on Slack. Well, the, it was the preliminary stuff. I don't think I shared the original, the final original. Maybe it was just one part of it. I don't yeah. remember which it was before or after. Final so we can version. post it to there. Yeah. So, love to that. And it's a really great resource, too. So if you're going to be doing it, planning for events, highly recommend actually looking on it in Drupal.org. Yep. And if you're interested in volunteering with us, <laughs> we encourage it. You can follow us on social media. Um, our LinkedIn is there. You can also just type in contact and then one of us will get to you. A real person because we just don't have anyone else. No and for all of our events and anything that we do, we actually do have a Gov Drupal Slack. It is not Drupal Slack. It is Gov Drupal Slack. And the reason we have it is because we have to do sub things. You can't do that on Drupal Slack. I can't have a Gov Drupal and then inside of that we have other things that just doesn't work that way so we have to have our own so feel free to join us over there too uh, thank you so much for attending our talk I hope you